ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وبعد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد Always and forever we begin with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send our prayers of peace upon the Nabi al-Kareem Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I always begin by admonishing myself and you and reminding myself and you of taqwa Allah. And that's an inner awakening. It's something that occurs in our heart. And the hope is that it manifests itself in our words, deeds and conduct. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that which is in our heart better than what we seek to display publicly to others Allahumma ameen Today alhamdulillah we join together in celebration of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam And you know when 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 we mention the name Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's a religious obligation upon us to send our prayers of peace upon him And therefore I pray inshallah that you are inspired to be from those who are quite articulate and saying Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad when you hear his name when you hear his mention or when his description is made known to you inshallah which is the basis of my discussion with you today the ulama from very early on whenever they would come to speak about our rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam they would usually begin with things like saying ma ajmala muhammada how beautiful was muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and today I'm, I'm, I'm not going to limit my scope and my discussion with you with regards to you know, his physical features and his beauty which, which are astounding and inshallah we will talk about the Prophet in that regard. But I want to talk to you about the beauty of the Prophet in a variety of circumstances. I want to show you his beauty at a moment of anger. And I want to show you his beauty in love. And I want to talk about his beauty in compassion. And I want to talk about his beauty in worship. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And if we were to sit here literally and I, I you know I understand Alhamdulillah that you at um, the School of Oriental <laughs> huh? and African Studies Alhamdulillah have been blessed with a vast um, array of opportunities to look at Islam, Islamism, politics, history, Muhammadism <laughs> Uh, you've been given an opportunity to study things from a variety of perspectives. And today I want to speak, you know, alhamdulillah, to a vastly majority crowd of Muslims uh, about the man who we give his name to our children. The man whose his children's name adorn our children's name. The man who we sacrifice, really, kith, kin, wealth, on behalf of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I was visiting him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Al-Madina Al-Munawwara and I remember sitting in the shade of his masjid sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And see, when you sit near the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, your tahiyyat feels different. You know when you're doing your salah and here you are in London and the hustle and bustle and the busyness and you catch your salah in that little room with a green carpet back there and you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim. And, and it's kind of hurried because you got class, you got to catch a bus, and there's going to be traffic, and I didn't have lunch, and you kind of miss out on his beauty. But there's a beauty and a symmetry. Like if the Prophet was to walk in upon you, before he entered, you would sense him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like you would feel his presence. He's the man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who the angels encircled. 
And the Sahaba, you know, when they described the Prophet ﷺ, if they were to talk about his physical beauty, some of those who have known him their whole life, even before Islam, such as people like Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, for years before he came to Islam, he knew the Prophet before the Prophet received revelation, and for many years he resisted faith. But when you were to speak to Amr ibn al-As many years later, and the tabi'een, you know, people who had never met the Prophet, they would say, you saw Rasulullah sallallahu He would say, yes. And they would say, sifu lana. What does he look like? And he would say, I don't know. If I was to try to describe to you his detail, I would fail. Because I couldn't look him directly in the eye and keep his gaze. Like I would look at him, but his majesty, his awe, you know, the inspiration that I would feel with him, his haiba, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would compel me to turn away. You know, there's this wonderful statement of Aisha radiallahu anha, where she says, you know, I dropped a needle. And back then their homes weren't like this. There wasn't, uh, you know, diffuse lighting and so on. She says, I was sewing, I dropped the needle and I was looking for it. And when the Prophet ﷺ turned his face to look from it, the nur of his face showed it to me. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, you would feel him before you saw him. You would smell him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before you saw him. The people in Medina, when they wanted to find out where the Prophet was, all they had to do was like, smell the roses. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Literally, when he would walk through a pathway, the blessed scent of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would linger and perforate through the air to such a degree that a person who came minutes later, many minutes later, would say the Prophet just walked this way and you could navigate from one point to the next until you caught up to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he was to walk in through that door, he wouldn't be tall that you would say, wow, he's tall. And he wouldn't be short that you would wonder, you know, he's, he's, he's not of average height. His hair was dark, his irises were dark, the white of his eyes were fleshy white. They weren't blood, bloodshot, they were clear. And if you saw him from a distance, it's almost as if you would say, wow, his eyelashes have mascara or what's called kuhl. You know, like, look at those eyelashes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His nose was full, but not hawkish. And his eyebrows were full and not joined, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he walked, his shoulders, he stood proud and tall. He never hunched over and he never slouched. And if he walked, people had to run to catch him because he was a man of purpose. Like he knew where he was going and where he was coming from. He wasn't a person who was like, you know, distracted, which way should I go? His walk, his pace, was that of someone having to kind of jog to stay at pace with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His sweat was finer than musk. Umm Ayman, Umm Salim, and Umm Sulaim. You know, you know, when the Prophet وسلم, she, he stayed in her place for a little bit and he was sleeping on a leather, a leather, uh, uh, you know, blanket. And it was a hot day, so some of his, his, his uh, sweat had pooled a little bit in it. And she took a vessel, and she threw out the perfume she had, and she took his sweat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas ibn Malik, you know, who served the Prophet from the you know, very young age of six, seven, eight years old. He was the guy that would walk around with the Prophet ﷺ. as a young kid. His mother had put him in the service of the Prophet ﷺ. He was always around the Prophet ﷺ, and that's why he was one of the great fuqaha of our ummah. He knew so many things about the Prophet ﷺ. Anas ibn Malik, he would say, I've never in my life felt anything softer than his hand, nor more fragrant than his sweat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he looked at you, he would not break his gaze until you did. And it did not matter whether you were rich or poor. And the one who had access to him was not on account of their social status in life. It was simply on account of them wanting his presence in their life. And therefore you hear of the Prophet Wasallam that he would accept to break a meal with a person who had nothing more than a date to offer. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would never turn anyone away. And he would say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the Sahaba they did scribe and they say, Ma Sami'atu Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
لا قط إلا في لا إله إلا الله. Not once did I ever hear the Prophet say no, لا, except in لا إله إلا الله. Never did anyone ask him for anything. He said لا. It was always yes, صلى الله عليه وسلم. And even if it was at an inconvenience to what others would perceive in him. You know, there was this occasion, you see it in Bukhari, where a man comes and he pulls at the Prophet's garment, وسلم, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I want this thing you're wearing. This thing. I don't want another one. The one you're wearing right now in front of me. And the Sahaba were so embarrassed by the action of this Bedouin man who just come, come to faith. You know, he was a rough kind of person. And the Prophet وسلم, goes into one of the Sahaba's home, Abu Ayyub's, and borrows something to wear and gives that man that, that, that shawl. And the Sahaba, they gather around this man and they say, don't you know that the Prophet وسلم, and it was at a time of poverty before the Battle of Khaybar, this is, you know, it was, it was, it was a time where Aisha describes radiallahu anha, that there was no fire that was lit in his home for two weeks to cook anything. There was no need. That they survived on the two dark things, dates and water. You see, water wasn't like this. Water was from a well, mud. That's what they lived on, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the man took the only shirt off his back. And the Sahaba surround this man and they say, you know, c- couldn't you just ask for something else? Like, y- you've come to the Prophet ﷺ in such an inconvenient time. And that man said to them, I don't care. I want to be buried wearing this. Like he took it for no other reason than he loved the Prophet ﷺ so much that he wanted to have something that he could be entombed with it. That on the day of resurrection, the Prophet would recognize him and say, hey, that's my shirt. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, the people who would see the kings, you know, there were Arabs who would travel all over the world. And they would sit with, you know, like the emperor, or they would sit with the uh, Khusra in, in, in Persia or Al Akhbat in Egypt. And they would be amazed at how the kings were treated by their servants. And in the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah, one of the main ambassadors of Quraysh, he went to negotiate with the Prophet Sallallahu and he came back to Quraysh and he said, whatever you do with this man, I recommend that you do it quickly. Because the Sahaba that he has around him, treat him in a way that no king I have ever seen or been in his presence is treated. When he speaks, they listen. When he makes his wudu, they fight over who will take the drops that fall off his arm, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If he stands, they stand with him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. See, the physical beauty of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam exceeded that of Yusuf. You know, we know in the Quran that Prophet Yusuf was so beautiful that you know when that mistress tried to seduce him. And the people in her city mocked him, as Allah narrates in the twelfth chapter in Surah Yusuf in the Quran, that she, you know, she gathered all these royal women and put them in one room, and she gave each of them a sikin. And she said to Prophet Yusuf, "Come on in." And the Prophet describes Yusuf by saying that he was given half of beauty, like half of the beauty that we estimate in mankind. He embodied it in that one person, that great prophet of Allah. And when he walked in, أَكْبَرُ nahu, It's like saying, takbir. You know, it's like so handsome. أَكْبَرُ nahu, They held him in such high esteem. وَقَطَّعْنَ أَيْدِيَهُنَّ And they cut open their hand by mistake. They're cutting fruit, but they were so mesmerized, they didn't know what they were doing. وَقُلْنَا حَاشَ لِلَّهِ مَا هَذَا بَشَرًا This man can't be a human being. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ He's angelic in his beauty and quality. And yet we know that the Prophet Sallallahu beauty exceeded Yusuf's. But it was cloaked with that honor that turned away the sight of friends like Amr ibn al-Ghas radiallahu anhu wa arda. That awe, that mystique of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The physical beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu is one dimension. And you know there's books like Shama'il, there was a brother who had the book of Shama'il with him here. And it's something that I'll, you know, I, I, I have a course uh, coming in, 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 in a couple of days in Queen Mary, 
about Al-Mustafa, who is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi It's a two-day program where we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi but more importantly, my aim is to is extract from his life, life lessons that we can kind of like mirror who he was into who we are. And that's really the aim of this concept of Sunnah. It's not what you wear, and it's not, you know, mashallah, bismillah, subhanallah, that, that kind of thing. Rather, it's an embodiment, a modality of conduct. It's a pre-thought of how you will live your life in trying to measure it as best as you can to the best of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The physical beauty of the Prophet ﷺ is unending. And if you were to look to a full moon at its splendor or compare it to his face, you would love his face more. You know, those enchanting pictures that we have landscapes, it doesn't matter what, what inspires you, nothing would be greater than him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I, you know, I'll end this section where I talk about his physical features by you know, the request of one of the sisters, one of the sahabiyat at his time. When the Prophet's masjid, you know, it was kind of small, and he used to lean on a tree when he would give the Jum'ah, right? It was a small place. And the Prophet, what, that was just how he was, you know, don't cut down the tree, build the mosque around it. And the Prophet وسلم, literally was a tree hugger. Like literally. So one lady came and said, Ya Rasulullah, the masjid is so full. And when the men are there in the front of us, you know, we, it's the same thing that sisters talk about today, right? We don't have the access and all, you know. And we're sitting at the back, Ya Rasulullah, and all the men are in front of us, and we can't, I can't see you. And seeing the Prophet, Imam Ibn Hajr, he explained this hadith by saying that looking at the Prophet was ibadah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I can't see you. If I ask one of my helpers, if one of my workers, to build you a pulpit for you to stand on it, so when you're talking, I can see you, would you use it? He said, yes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's where the blessed mimbar of the Prophet came from. So she built it, and on that weekend, the mimbar is put in the back there, and he stands on it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that little date palm tree that was growing in his masjid began to weep, audibly, like it literally cried. And when the Prophet heard it and the Sahaba heard it, the Prophet came down from his mimbar, وَضَمَّ الْجِزَحْ Hugged the tree. وَحَسَّ عَلَيْهِ Patted it. وَوَشَّ إِلَيْهِ and whispered to it, Hatta askata, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His, his beauty resonated, was felt, was absorbed, was relished. It was something that everyone who ever met him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, could not deny. But the beauty that lasts with us today extends beyond the physical. And therefore when we talk about the beauty of the Prophet ﷺ, it's wonderful that we dwell on the shama'il, but it's more wonderful that we begin to analyze the beauty of his character and the beauty of his conduct and what he represented. And more importantly, what glimpses of it can I have? And I want you for the rest of my discussion to take note of this hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-mu'minu mir'at al-mu'min. That a believer is the reflected image of another believer. And the greatest believer, Aman al Rasul, the greatest one who believed in God, is Muhammad Sallallahu and I want to mirror him. Because unless I can look at him and see myself, and unless he can look into me and see me, and unless you and I ask ourselves, if the Prophet walked into my life today, would he recognize me? Like, am I one of his? Am I, am I him? And unless you, 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 you feel confident, that the words you use and the prayer you perform and the acts you seek have some semblance in his life and in his tradition, you should worry and it's important to worry. And it's not about feeling guilty, it's about wanting to do better in life. And therefore men and women both find a mirrored reflection in his modality and traditions. I want to talk to you about his beauty in worship. Because the essence of your faith is worship. You were only created so that you can extend to God service in whatever capacity. And you as a student here with the right niyyah and with the right intention and doing it for God is service to God. To honor your family, to educate your mind, to in, inshallah in future earn halal rizq 
that turns you away from that which is haram, that gives you authority over those who may not know the truth so that you can lead them to it. All of that is ibadah. And all of that is you sitting there in a chair and lecture board. Saying, when is this 45 minute talk going to end? Of course, not my talk, right? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But it's ibadah. And ibadah of the Prophet ﷺ was wondrous. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk to you about him standing at night. Because you'll say, well, that's a command of Allah to him. It, is, it was a command. It's different to you and I. He was commanded. But I want you to see why. See, that same moment after he first received revelation, the next set of verses that would come were very symbolic. Two kinds that depict the same moment. Ya ayyuhal mudathir and ya ayyuhal muzammil. What does Allah say in ya ayyuhal mudathir? O one who is enveloped with cloaks. Huh? What's the first command? Qumil. Qumil layla illa qalila. O you who are enveloped in your cloaks, O you who are terrified by this mission I've just given you, stand up by night and pray. Nisfahu. Half the night. Awzid alayhi. Maybe more, maybe less. And then Allah takes the same snapshot, the same moment and says, Ya ayyuhal muzammil, O one who's covered up in cloaks, Qum fa'andir. Get up and call people to the truth. That's symmetry. The Prophet success by day in calling people to the truth was guaranteed by the anchor of righteous belief and conduct of praying by night. And sometimes we look to ourselves and we say, man, I'm really, I'm struggling in life. Like I'm struggling, I'm struggling with work. I'm struggling my studies. God, my parents are always on my back. My sister keeps taking this from me. And we see like our day life is chaotic and hectic. And the reason, the reason, simply for no other reason, is that our night life is hollow. It's empty. And there's nothing there. But see, it wasn't like that. The Prophet was taught from the very moment, you want to be successful, قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ You must ensure it, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And there's that beauty of worship. Do you know what the greatest thing that the Prophet ﷺ did in worship, what it was? It was just the simple dhikr that you and I are taught to make. Like his tongue was wet with what? The dhikrullah. You know, the verses that the brother recited which talk about the Prophet ﷺ, they include that as a subtlety in it. اُذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا هُوَ الَّذِي يُصَلِّي عَلَيْكُمْ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ Remember Allah plentifully, abundantly. And for that, it will be God who will send his salah upon you. لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ مِّنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ And that will take you out of the darkness, which is an illusion of the difficulties you face in the daytime in life. See, the duality of the Qur'an is that the darkness is in the daytime. And the light, you earn it in the night. The nur in your life is night. And when you look at the Prophet's life, he was so abundant in his prayer that Aisha, you know, the hadith is in Bukhari, his house was so small, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, <coughs> that when he would stand up in prayer and he would teach us that we pray our extra suppurgatory prayers, not in the masjid. Although he three, four paces from the mosque, he would pray his night prayer in, in his home, even though it was an inconvenience for his wife. The house was so small that when Aisha was laying down and the Prophet wanted to fall into sujood, he would have to tap her foot to let her know, move your foot into your chest so I can prostrate. Every night, you know, every time he's praying, he's waking her up. If she isn't able to pray with him, she draws in her feet. You would say, why is the Prophet inconveniencing his wife every few minutes, waking her up out of a good sleep? You know, why doesn't he just let her sleep, sallallahu alayhi wasallam? The answer is, it's, you know, it's to teach us that tradition. That there's, you know, for us, worship is the essence of who you and I are. And I want to give you just a, a, a simple insight 
into three things that if we do them will connect us directly to the habit of the Prophet Muhammad that that beauty of his life where the Sahaba would say to him, Ya Rasulullah, why do you stand so long in prayer that your feet have become swollen? He would say, Afala akunu abdan shakura. Shouldn't I be thankful for everything I have? Like why shouldn't I be thankful? I know God has forgiven me. It's not about forgiveness. It's not about Jannah. It's more about love. The love of the one who I stand before each and every day and each and every moment. First, recognize Allah's blessings. That's ibadah. See the, you know, I want you to consider what you have, like this bottle, MashaAllah, Jazakumullah Khair, thank you for watering me. Um, this is my rizq, what I've taken from it anyway, is mine. Do you know what that means? None of you, no one in this city, no one in this world could have tasted what I tasted of that water. A hundred million years ago, this water could have been an iceberg in the Arctic Shelf that broke off and melted, became salt water, that was trans-evaporated and rained down in Brazil and traveled 10 million years ago in underground aquifers only to be bottled in England and to be bottled, purchased by someone other than myself, carried here by other than myself, delivered here for no other person than any other day, than any other time, then Yahya Ibrahim is going to have it. It's mine. <laughs> See, that's rizq. That's the meaning that whatever has been given to you, no one can take it. And whatever wasn't written for you, that other bottle over there, it's not mine. It's someone else's. And there could be someone who bought this for themselves, but it ended up with me. See, that was the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that's why you say, Bismillah. So when I tell you connect and be thankful to Allah for what you have, therefore when you come and you say, Bismillah, I acknowledge that this came to me only because of Allah. أَأَنْتُمْ أَنزَلْتُمُوهُ مِنَ الْمُزْ Who brought this rain down to you? Who collected it for you? Who carried it to you? Who, who enriched it for you? Who brought it towards you? It is Allah. And that's the first level of worship. It's called recognition, mushahada, that Allah is involved in every drop of water that I take. And at the end of my drink, what do you say? Alhamdulillah, I thank you, O Allah, for what I have. It's a totality of worship. So connect to Allah through the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah of worship in those little mundane things. Second, I ask you to do more in terms of the extra things he taught us. It is without a doubt in my mind, alhamdulillah, that I believe I'm, I'm with people who pray their five daily prayers. It's without a doubt, alhamdulillah, those of you who are committed to our deen, that you're fulfilling your salah. But now I'm asking you to do that just a little bit more. Where I'm saying to you that the Prophet ﷺ said, and I want you to think about it. The Prophet, after burying a Sahabi, we're almost done? Where are I? Uh -huh. The Prophet ﷺ, one of the Sahaba was just buried, and he and the other companions stood around his grave. And see, we don't understand normally this hadith until we actually think about it a little bit. And the Prophet pointed to the grave and he said, For this man, if you were to ask him if he was to be brought back to life after what he now knows, after what he now has seen, after the reality has made, been made plain, if you were to ask this man, would you prefer to be given the world and all that's in it or two rak'ah? What would you choose? That man who now knows the truth will say, I just want two rak'ah. You know, you hear that hadith where the Prophet said, two rak'ah are better than the world and all that's in it. That's what it means. That the moment you cross that threshold, there is nothing more that you would want if, ever, if you were to be offered the universe, but it would come to an end with death again and you're going to stand before God. If you were to have nothing except to do two sincere prostrations and be accepted by Allah, you would choose that and live your life in poverty. So I want you to do that little bit more. I want you to pray the two rak'ah before Fajr. I want you that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, he told us that worship, the best of it is what is simplest and consistent. You know, 
when you hear the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu like Imam Bukhari's book, it's an awesome book, thousands of hadith. Do you know what the last hadith in it? The last hadith in it is a summary of the whole book. Imam Bukhari simply says, the very last hadith, as with Muslim, as with an Imam in Nawawi, Israel, the Salihin, all the Imams of hadith have made this as a subtle, implicit tradition. The very last hadith they record is what? Kalimatan. If you just say these two words, Khafifatan ya'ala lisan they're very easy to recite on your tongue. Anyone can memorize it. But they are thaqilatani fil mizan. They are enormously heavy on the scales on the day of judgment. Subhanallah wa bihamdih subhanallah al If you can master that, you're successful in life. If you can recite ayat al kursi, the Prophet says in the hadith of Abu Dawood, it's sahih, the one who recites ayat al kursi after every prayer is in Jannah. The only reason you're not yet there is because you're not dead yet. Wow. Like khalas, Jannah wajabat, it's wajib. But you haven't entered yet because you're still breathing. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said, the one who recites ayat al kursi, just one ayah, we all know it, we all know it. The one who, you can read it on your gold chain that you're wearing, right, for the girls, or read on the wall that you have at home. The one who reads ayat al kursi at night, at night, Hufidha wajaru. He and his home is protected and his neighbor. So there's John sitting there watching the footy, uh, fo- not footy, you call it football here, right? He's watching the football game and the only reason he doesn't get robbed is because you're next door and you read Ayat al-Kursi. It's amazing, like it's amazing. Simplicity, the Prophet ﷺ says, the one who says Subhanallah wa bihamdi, a hundred times. His sins are forgiven even if they were to cover the oceans. Allahu Akbar. So do that little bit more. And the reason I say that is the Prophet said, إِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ If I invite you to do something good, فَأْتُوا بِهِ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Do as much of it as you can. Right? It's an invitation for you to do as much as you can. Third thing with regards to the Prophet wasallam and his beauty in worship, and it's something that I invite myself and you to, is to assist others in it. Like don't ever be a deterrent for other people. And do you know how many times people talk about da'wah but very few talk about un-da'wah? Like that sour face that you give someone <laughs> and it pushes them away from the masjid? Or you know, there was, I, I was giving a talk at, at, uh, back home in Perth at my university, Western Australia, and the talk was titled, um, a Muslim's guide to recovering from tragedy. Like how do you recover from pain? Heartbreak, a, an illness in the family, uh, a bad relationship, you know, whatever. And there was a sister, she emailed me the very, that same night, 11 o'clock at night I got home and my email, there was an email there. And she said, uh, I, if I didn't need to be there for this talk because the, the topic was so relevant to what I was going through in life, I would have walked out. As I was walking in, although I'm not visibly Muslim, meaning I don't wear hijab, I just asked, you know, some of the girls, some of the other Muslim sisters who do, who are visibly Muslim, you know, which lecture hall is it? And they kind of looked at me like, who are you and why are you even going? You're not even, like, you barely look Muslim. Like, they gave her that kind of brush over the shoulder, you know, that, that idiocy that you see at times within our community where someone doesn't look religious so you assume that you're better than them for some reason? So she said, if I didn't need to, I would have just turned and left, but I wanted to be there and I'm glad I stayed. And that is, that repulsive behavior that we at times display is completely the antithesis of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Completely, the different, complete, everything is different to who he was Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you ask the Sahaba, they say, no one smiled at anyone more than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like he was just so welcoming. Peace and blessings be upon him. So be a person who leads people to good. They asked the Prophet, who's the best of people? He said, anfa'ahum linnas. The one who is, gives people people the most benefit, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now I am conscious of time and as I said, I could talk to you and others can talk to you for weeks about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
But I want to talk to you, you know, just one more section, and I, I'm conscious of your time, uh, about the beauty of his love. You know, sometimes when you read, sometimes we misread the sunnah. Like, you know how sometimes you read a, <laughs> I, I was once standing, waiting for the Maghrib prayer, and I just picked up, it was in Toronto, I picked up uh, Riyadh al-Salihin, one of the first translations of Riyadh al-Salihin, and, you know, I was waiting for the, uh, the Iqamah to be called, so I was reading it, and I read the English of a hadith, it was just random, I just opened it random to any page, and the hadith, <laughs> it said, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to love curry. I thought, curry? Did I just, maybe it's a typo or something. Curry, that hot, spicy, Asian <laughs> fusion of leaves and turmeric, really? The pro Let me read the Arabic to this, I turn over the page. And it says, the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet used to love the stew that the meat was cooked in. Now, if you're a translator in Southeast Asia, that stew is that delicious, hot, spicy curry. And I could almost see, you know, this new Muslim who's, man, it's so spicy, but the Prophet loved it, so I, I gotta have some curry. What can I do, right? So, you know, there, there's, there's so much in the Sunnah, and it's not because that person meant any harm, but it's just human, human infallibility. That's just all it is. And don't think it's just limited to non-era, you know, something like that. Uh, you, you find lots of that kind of stuff, whether in translations of the Quran or other things. But you guys, inshallah, I pray you find your expertise in that. Allahumma ameen. When you read certain hadith, you like there's this one hadith. Uh, all of you know it. Uh, any of you not hear that the Prophet and Aisha had a race? Everyone knows, oh, the Prophet and Aisha... They had a race in the desert, right? Everyone's heard this or not? Yes? Who hasn't? You haven't? Oh, okay. Well, right. well let, let's correct it because it's, it's kind of not correct anyway. <laughs> Basically what happened was, it, see, it's just a mistranslation. It's taken the whole romanticism out of his life. Basically, whenever the prophet went, you know, there was, a, a, there was need for war and they went out in expedition, the prophet would take with him one of his wives or more. And on this occasion, it was Aisha. And after, you know, so many weeks away from Medina and so many weeks amongst all these Sahaba men, the Prophet just wants to chill out with his wife Aisha radiallahu anha, right? That's, that's really the crux of the hadith. So he says to the army, his Sahaba, hey, why don't you guys start marching? We'll catch up to you, right? So basically, if I was to translate the hadith, it would be, it wouldn't be the Prophet and Aisha had a race. It would be, the Prophet and Aisha radiallahu anha alayhi afdalu salaam wa salam they walked hand in hand romantically in the sand dunes of Arabia as the sun was setting and the wind was swirling, right? That's really what he wanted. It was an act of love, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, there's another hadith with Aisha radiallahu anha where all of us know about tayammum. Like if you don't have water for wudu, you can make tayammum. You strike the ground, brush it off, Wipe your face, khalas, bismillah. Whether it's hadith akbar or asghar. But we, don't, we, we all know that it's in the Quran, but we don't know the story behind it. Like Sometimes we're taught just the fiqh, but we don't know the, the beauty of his sunnah behind it. The Prophet and Aisha, once again, they were on a journey, and Aisha had gone to the bathroom, meaning she went far away into the desert. And while there, she had a uqd, which is a black, she had a necklace. And it was made of black string and black volcanic stones, shiny stones. And it's dark, it's Maghrib now. And because it was in the hot months, the Sahaba, they used to rest by day and travel by night. So right as soon as they did their Maghrib and Isha prayer, they combined it, they would put everything together and head out. Now Aisha, she had gone out to use the, use the desert and that aqd fell fell off. So she came back and now they're in enemy territory. The Prophet, they've done their prayer. They don't have enough water for the next day. Like they can't camp there anymore. So they need to get travel by night to the next place of water so that they can guarantee their survival. And in enemy territory, it's even more earnest for them. Aisha comes and whispers to the Prophet, I lost my necklace. 
Now, you know, if my wife were waiting at like Sydney Airport and she like says, oh, I lost my watch. I'd be like, get on the plane, woman. I'll get you another watch. <laughs> it's just a watch. Don't worry about the watch. We're not gonna miss the plane because I'm gonna go searching for your watch. That's just logic for me. A'udhu billah. May Allah protect me, Ya Rab. May Allah help us, Ya Rab. But not the Prophet Zayisallam. The Prophet orders Abu Bakr, tell the men to unpack camp and put it back up. We're gonna spend the night because we're looking for a necklace. Now Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is whose father? Aisha. He goes after her, man. He goes for a necklace. How you do that? And there you have the Prophet orders the Sahaba to go out in the dark to search for a black thread necklace with black beads. So there's Umar like searching the ground. Could you imagine Umar ibn Khattab looking for a necklace in the desert? Who's gonna find that? So the Sahaba, they got angry with Aisha, which means Abu Bakr saw this. So Abu Bakr got angry with Aisha and Aisha says, the Prophet وسلم, he was resting with me and his head was against my chest and Abu Bakr was whispering in my ear. <laughs> and Aisha says, I did not answer because so, I didn't want to disturb the Prophet وسلم. When Fajr approached, they came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah If we use the water for wudu, we will die. There's not enough water to take us and our animals to the next well. And the verses of tayammum had not yet arrived. And the Prophet said, Insha'Allah there will be a solution. Something will happen. And Aisha, at that moment, she says, I felt depression, like the whole world collapsed on me. And at that moment, Allah revealed, in kuntum junuban, if you were in a state of janaba or you've broken your wudu, fatayammamu sa'idan tayyiba. Use the earth to make tayammu. All those Sahaba and Abu Bakr and everyone who was so upset with Aisha when these verses of ease and rahmah came, they said, Aisha's the greatest, and Abu Bakr's family is always giving and generous, and look at the blessing that has arrived. But what's the point of this hadith? The point of this hadith is the Prophet ﷺ inconvenienced the many for the one who was near, the one he loved, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You know, that's that's beauty, and it teaches us subtle things. You know, inshallah, when you're married, <coughs> if you aren't already that you find you know, in your heart that ability to always choose your wife, always choose your husband, always choose your children, always choose your father and mother before the, the distant from you, right? That was Rasulullah said. that was beauty. And you know, Aisha and, and the Prophet وسلم, their love story wasn't just something that was, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing. It, Shakespeare had nothing on them. Like Aisha, she used to have code language with the Prophet I mean, They used to have their own language. Like own kind of, you know, husband wifey kind of stuff. Aisha, she says to him, Ya Rasulullah, sif hubbakli. It's not how much do you love me, she says, describe how much you love me. That's some romance stuff, man. <laughs> like, you know, how do you do that? So the Prophet describes it very aptly. He says, I love you with the strength and the description like al uqd like a knot that is tied. Whenever others pull it from opposite sides, it just gets tighter. <laughs> See? <laughs> See, that's how, you know, when you hear that, how can a wife not be like, damn, he loves me, I love him too. That's, that's it. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he says that, every time, you know, the Prophet, the Prophet would be in his masjid ﷺ, and Aisha, she just put her head out, you know, from the door or something. And she, no one else knows this, right? No one out from the Sahaba, her father, no one knows it. And she just put her head out and say, Ya Rasulullah, كيف العقد اليوم? How's that not today? <laughs> and the Prophet would smile at her and say, كأول يوم ربط. It's as strong as the first day I tied it. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, that's... And that translated into an effect on his personal life, his family life, his Sahaba. So, um, you know, Ali radiallahu anhu, the cousin of the Prophet his son-in-law married Fatima al-Zahra radiallahu anhuma. 
uh, you know, this is a famous story. Uh, Ali, he came home one day, unknown to Fatima. He came early from work, basically. You know, he came home from work. And his wife, Kana Tastak, Fat Fatima, she was standing brushing her teeth. Back then, it was she used that twig, a siwak of the araq tree. So she's brushing her teeth. She doesn't see him behind her, right? She's brushing her teeth. Now, if I come home and my wife's in the bathroom brushing, it's not like gonna make me spell poetry. <laughs> like, you know, oh, look at the beauty of the, the foam in your teeth. You know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do that, right? So there you have the, you know, Ali comes home and his wife's brushing her teeth. And he spouts some poetry, man. He says, Ya ud al araka kaifa araka. O twig of an Eric tree, how can I see you in this embrace? Law kunta rajulan laqataltuka. If you were a man, I would have killed you. <laughs> now, if you're, she'd be like, really? <laughs> you know? It's like, it's love, man. That, they had that love. And the Prophet was very expressive. You know, that beauty of love is something that at times is missing from our description of the Prophet ﷺ. People outside, they don't know this stuff. Like when they hear about our Prophet ﷺ, they only hear, you know, these at times, uh, you know, vulgar things, inaccuracies that are, you know, uh, 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 that are blemishes. And the Prophet ﷺ is nur of beauty, you know, his light of beauty is just outshines. You know, the, 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 the fraudulence of, of the fraudsters. And I want you to see, you know, that his beauty, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, extended not just physically, not just in words, not just in worship. And if we could literally sit here and, and talk about his beauty in anger and in compassion and in conquest and in warfare, and it, it's unending, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My aim is to inspire you that you kind of take a journey with him sallallahu alaihi wasallam and whether you do that you know by reading more or listening to others talk about him more or just by simply sitting and mentioning him more you know i began by telling you when you're in medina and you're close to him it feels different but the that you know the reality is and ironically Sometimes you need the mention of the Prophet ﷺ at a distance from him to appreciate him more. If, if all that you do is just that you increase your salawat and your durood upon the Prophet ﷺ, you will have succeeded. And I conclude with the hadith of Ubay ibn Ka'b, the Sahih hadith in Abu Dawood, where Ubay <coughs> kana lahu haja, he had a need, you know, he was going to ask Allah for something. And he said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have a need, I'm going to ask Allah. But of course, I'm going to share that need by asking Allah to bless you and send peace upon you. And I'm going to make half of my dua for myself and half sending its salam upon you. And the Prophet said, if you do that, it's good. And if you were to increase upon me, it's more. So he said, I'm going to make two thirds salah upon you and a third in asking for myself. And the Prophet said, if you do that, it's good, but if you increase, it's more. And Ubayy said, I'm going to make all of my request, not for myself and say, oh Allah, give me this and this. I'm not going to even ask any of that. I'm just going to ask Allah to bless and send his blessings and peace upon you, O Messenger of Allah. And at that, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you were to do that, Allah would give you what you have not asked for and all your needs would be met and all the harm that was arriving would be deterred. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alameen innaka hamidun majid. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. I thank uh, the MSA or the Islamic Society uh, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you success and taking time to join me. Uh, I know it's uh, a busy time in the year. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from you and I. Wa salli lahuma wa sallim wa zid wa barik ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Keep the faith.